We're being overwhelmed by news reports describing the apparent collapse of the Iron Curtain. We now see non-communist premiers in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, the Berlin Wall has fallen and remnants are being sold in the United States. Lithuanians are demanding independence. In fact, U.S. News and World Report recently featured a cover story, has Russia collapsed? Has communism collapsed? Will Russia be next? When many people consider these global moves on the political chessboard, some are very relieved at this apparent change within the Soviet Union. Others, however, see this as something to dread. They see this positioning as a suggestion that we are entering the apocalyptic age and the time is ripe for the appearance of Antichrist. This is what Catholics believe. I'm Julius Smetona. With me today to discuss these tremendous political happenings in Eastern Europe are three Roman Catholic priests who celebrate the traditional Latin Mass exclusively and reject the Second Vatican Council and the new religion which it generated. Father William Jenkins is pastor of St. Teresa of the Child Jesus Church in Parma, Ohio. Father Donald Sanborn is pastor of St. Pius X Church in Warren, Michigan. And Father Clarence Kelly is spiritual director of a congregation of traditional nuns, the Daughters of Mary in Round Top, New York. Reverend Fathers, welcome to What Catholics Believe. Uh, my first question is, how do you view these events taking place behind the Iron Curtain? Uh, Kelly. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's interesting that we're having this program today because there was an article in the Cleveland uh, Plain Dealer, I believe is the name of the newspaper, which reports that a, an agent of the KGB who defected in 1984, before any of these things were even imagined by people in the West, he predicted exactly what would happen. He specifically said the Berlin Wall would come down. He said a coalition government in Poland would be established, including solidarity. He said that uh, Alexander Dubček would be resurrected and that there would be a, uh, a, head, a, a head of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union who had the appearance of being liberal. And he said that the reason they were going to do this, and mind you, this is a high KGB official, uh, Anatoly Galitsyn. He said the reason they were going to do it is because they wanted to psychologically disarm the West. And in psychologically disarming the West, uh, they would be far more disposed uh, to disarm militarily. So I think that it's the height of foolishness uh, for people to be jumping on some kind of a bandwagon thinking that everything has changed because these events are unfolding. We must remember that for the most part, the one who is uh, orchestrating this sequence of events in Eastern Europe uh, is Gorbachev, and Gorbachev is the head of the Communist Party, and he was put in by uh, the rulers of the Communist Party in order to, to do a certain thing. So I think from a political point of view, uh, people have to be very, very cautious. I think it's, uh, it's foolishness for them to let their guard down because these things happening. But I personally think that there really is more afoot than simply trying to disarm the West from a military point of view. I think that the big scheme, the big plan for the unification of Europe and eventually the unification of the world under one uh, totalitarian state is perhaps uh, on the horizon. Father Sanborn, how would you consider this, or is it even proper to consider this from a moral and theological standpoint, these, these happenings in Europe and the world? Well, you have to take into consideration some very alarming facts, and that is that despite all of the show of a liberalization, the uh, Soviet Union and the leadership of the Soviet Union has not abandoned communism. They have not abandoned Leninism. Uh, the tomb of Lenin is still enshrined in the Kremlin, and uh, there is still a great devotion to Lenin. Uh, it is also true that the Berlin Wall still stands. There are just holes in it. 
uh, people seem to think that it's gone. It isn't gone. It's still very much there. There are just holes in it now. And it is also true that these people need exit visas to get out. They are still slaves in those countries. It's just that they've let the leash go a little bit. That's all. Um, and there are superficial changes, to be sure, and there seems to be some sort of rumbling in those countries that uh, to the effect that these people are, are sick of these kind of regimes. But uh, I, too, mistrust the, the Soviet Union uh, for the fact that they are communists and communists are liars. And the Catholic Church has condemned communism as, as the, the worst enemy ever to have come up against it. Father Jenkins, uh, many people make much of the Fatima message where Our Lady appeared in 1917 and said, if my requests are heeded, then there will be a period of peace and Russia will be converted. Otherwise, uh, dreadful catastrophes will take place. I hear many people saying that these events are in fact a sign that Our Lady's uh, wishes and requests were in fact fulfilled. Well, many are saying that. One of them is uh, Father Robert Fox, uh, who is a conservative member of the New Religion. Uh, but that's not true. That's not true. Our Lady said at Fatima in 1917 that we had uh, two alternatives. Either we prayed and did penance for sin, in which case Russia would be converted, or we would continue as we are, not praying and not doing penance, but continue to sin, and uh, Russia would spread her errors throughout the world. At the time that Our Lady foretold this, her words were scoffed at because it was inconceivable that Russia could do anything. She was a prostr uh, country prostrate with civil war. But in fact, uh, the truth of her prophecy has become uh, all too apparent. Now. Have we, in fact, uh, prayed and done the penance that we should have? Well, I, I don't think there's any evidence of that whatsoever. Uh, the Catholic Church, of course, being the church established by our Lord, was the one that received that message from the Mother of God. And uh, there are many Catholics in the world today who are completely ignorant of the message of Fatima, and they are in ignorance because of the, uh, the fact that their clergy and hierarchy are completely derelict duty. Uh, delictive duty. So I think we have to look at the other alternative as being the more uh, likely one, that Russia has spread her errors throughout the world. And sure, as you say, uh, and as Father Sanghorn just pointed out, the Berlin Wall has holes in it. But nonetheless, uh, uh, the Soviet Union remains a prison. Um, it's a matter of whether it's uh, a maximum security prison or a minimum security prison, perhaps, but it is still a prison and they can tighten up any time. Besides that, if you look at the West, Marx has spread his errors throughout the West. There's no question, but this, the Western part of the world has been Marxified. Uh, the ideas of uh, uh, totally secular governments that look upon inhabitants as being commodities without souls, right? uh, evolution being taught in the public schools, um, which has become a kind of religion uh, in our own day, um, you look at what has happened to the family. The very basic structure in our society and in any society is the family. Marx's teaching on that was that the family has to be socialized. Uh, the nuclear family has to disappear. Lenin also was uh, installing this idea of the family with a vengeance in the early days of the Soviet Union. And this is the idea we have in this country now. The nuclear family is falling apart. So there's no question with it, Marx has spread his, uh, Russia has spread Marx's ideas throughout the world, whether the Berlin Wall has holes in it or not. I understand that two of the errors of Marx are specifically materialism and evolution. And you're saying that both Reverend Fathers, you'd agree that these errors have spread and nothing is indicative of the fact that Russia is being converted. There's nothing to indicate that right now. <clears throat> uh, you do have a, a very serious uh, economic situation in the Soviet Union and also in Eastern Europe. And I, I think that uh, the, the rulers, the dictators who run the show, 
they were faced with uh, one of two alternatives, and one alternative perhaps would have been to impose a very repressive uh, persecution uh, and therefore set back, for example, the possibility of the ultimate merger of the, uh, of the Soviet Union with the United States. And the other is to allow a certain amount of uh, apparent liberalization in order to build up the economic situation behind the Iron Curtain so that the prospect of a possible merger, say, of the United States and the Soviet Union would be more acceptable to the American people. Mm -hmm. You know, in 1966, there was a testimony before Congress. Uh, there was a hearing on communist exploitation of religion, a committee on the judiciary, United States Senate, chaired by Senator Thomas Dodd. The gentleman giving the testimony was a Reverend Richard Wormbrand, who was a Lutheran minister. And I quote from one section of that testimony where he says as follows, I have seen Catholic priests, heroes, dying not only for Christ and confessing Christ to the end, but dying for the Pope. I have heard the word of a Catholic priest. I will not tell his name. He was asked, do you still believe in the Pope? And he said, since St. Peter, there has always been a Pope, and until Christ will come again, there will always be a Pope. And the actual Pope, Pius XII, has not made peace with you, and never will a Pope shake hands with you. He was trampled under the feet and tortured to death. Under our eyes, he was killed. At that time, a member of the government who killed this Catholic priest has been Gromyko, and the priest died with the hope that never will a pope shake hands with his murderers. Well, very recently, John Paul II shook hands with Gorbachev, and they each marked this meeting uh, with, uh, with great hopes for the future, a future of a new Europe. What is your view on this absolutely uh, precedent-breaking meeting between uh, John Paul II and, and Gorbachev? Well, if I might just add, uh, in answering that question to what I said before, uh, if you were to look at the picture of Gorbachev and John Paul II, Gorbachev is an international socialist. That's what communists are. Adolf Hitler was a national socialist. Hitler was a socialist just like Gorbachev. The difference is there was this element of nationalism in Hitler's socialism. There is internationalism in Gorbachev's. In other words, Gorbachev wants to conquer the entire world for the socialist cause. Let us say you had that picture up on the screen, and instead of shaking hands with Gorbachev, he was shaking hands with Adolf Hitler. What would be the reaction? Would people say, this is an indication if you could go back in time, for example, this is an indication that Hitler is softening. The point I'm trying to make is the perspective of the American people is completely distorted by the press. Uh, whereas it would be inconceivable to them to justify under any circumstances whatsoever a pope shaking hands with Adolf Hitler. To them, they perceive it as a good thing to shake hands with Gorbachev. But the communists have piled up far more bodies and have shed far more blood than the Nazis ever did. You could take the figure of perhaps uh, 10 to 12 million people uh, killed as a result of what the, uh, the Germans did in the Second World War, and you could multiply that by another 10, and you would not even come close to the number of people put to death ruthlessly. It is the henchmen of Gorbachev who are right now in Nicaragua. And, uh, in uh, El Salvador. These are the same people in Africa who are wreaking havoc against innocent people. Yes, many people are looking on the events in Europe, but they're ignoring the fact that meanwhile we're being surrounded literally in Central America, that it's a domino effect. As Lenin said, first we'll take the masses of Asia, then Europe, and finally we'll encircle the last bastion of capitalism. I think they're being taken in by the propaganda. I think that because the press portrays it as good, the people are just too dull. Mm -hmm. They are just too psychologically drugged to, to look at it in a true historical perspective. You're watching What Catholics Believe. I'm your Some of the recent letters we've been receiving from you, our viewers. A couple from Allentown, Pennsylvania wrote as follows. We are Protestants. We pray for you and your programs. God bless you both. You remind us of Old Testament prophets. They were writing to Father Kelly's, Fathers Kelly and Jenkins in response to our program on AIDS and purity. 
Another woman wrote us from Portage, Indiana, as follows, quote, It seems to me almost unreal to have found a program like yours on the air. Since Vatican II, I've always felt like I've fallen away from the Catholic faith because it isn't the same faith I was brought up with. I wish to thank you for the beautiful programs. And we wish to thank you for the beautiful sentiments. And if you'd like us to continue, please call 1-800-446-6163 and make a pledge to our operators. Uh, Father Sanborn, it's in, in stark contrast to the, the meeting with Gorbachev and uh, John Paul II is the encyclical letter of Pope Pius XI on atheistic communism. And it seems that he warned in 1936 of communist tactics that they say, for instance, thus aware of the universal desire for peace, the leaders of communism pretend to be the most zealous promoters and propagandists in the movement for world amity. And yet at the same time, they stir up a class, class warfare which causes rivers of blood to flow. And he concluded, see to it that the faithful are not deceived. Communism is intrinsically evil, and anyone who would save Christian civilization may not participate in it in any undertaking whatsoever. How, in the light of such a statement, which I believe, if, correct me if I'm wrong, would have the mark of, a, of, a, of teaching authority, how, can, how do we look on this development with John Paul II meeting Gorbachev, saying that they share a common vision of Europe, that he likes what he's seeing? How, how does a Catholic respond to something like this? Well, you have to first understand that John Paul II is a what we'd call a conciliar pope, that is, somebody who has accepted and promotes the reforms of Vatican II. Uh, he therefore has abandoned the traditional faith of the Catholic Church. And w with the abandonment of that faith, he has also abandoned the Church's traditional stance against communism. If you were to analyze his speeches and his uh, writings, uh, he is constantly calling for a new world economic order, which sounds very much like international socialism. And uh, I think that he sees these developments in Eastern Europe as something that is a great step in the direction of an international, global world order uh, in which there is an interdependence, uh, both uh, economic and cultural and religious, too, uh, of uh, all nations upon each other and uh, a type of world government. I, I think it's all fitting in. I think he wants to see one big world church and break down all the differences between uh, religions. Uh, this, uh, he, that's his main goal, it seems, uh, with all of his ecumenism. And uh, I think he's right in tune with, with all that's happening. You know, it's, uh, Gorbachev was saying, he's revealing now that he was baptized in the Ukrainian, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, and that perhaps the communists have looked on religion with too, in this too simplistic a matter. But it's interesting that when he visited Lithuania, one of the first things he did was he placed a wreath at a, a statue dedicated to Vladimir Lenin. Now, if he really changed, would he place the wreath there to a man who said, all religious ideas are unspeakable abominations. Father Jenkins, how would you interpret such an event? His laying of the wreath? That's right. I would consider it to be a, uh, a statement of his true belief. I think he is still a worshiper of Lenin. He's every inch a communist, which means he's every inch a liar, professional liar. And, uh, but I do not think that uh, Gorbachev's laying of the wreath at the foot of the statue of Lenin is nearly as bad as John Paul II laying verbal wreaths at the feet of the monument of Martin Luther. That is much more abhorrent. And I think uh, the two of them, Gorbachev and John Paul II, have a great deal in common in their approach to things, and I agree with Father Sanborn. I think Father, I think uh, John Paul II is preparing the world in a, uh, as a religious counterpart of Gorbachev uh, for a kind of religious ecumenism, while Gorbachev is the mastermind of the secular ecumenism. And these two are going to converge into a one-world system, which is going to be the, uh, 
immediate preparation, the proximate preparation for the coming of the Antichrist. But Julius, I think our viewers might be interested to know that you are the grandson of the last president of free Lithuania. Well, that's, that's true. <laughs> that's true, and uh, he, in fact, signed a concordat with Pope Pius XI mm -hmm. in 19, I believe, 27, establishing the Catholic Church as the official religion of the state. And when I think about that, and I see what's been happening with Gorbachev and John Paul II, it's, it's shocking, <coughs> because Gorbachev now says that the communists no longer say they are always right, and this is what the conciliar church says. They say we are, in fact, not the true church, that we don't have a monopoly of, of truth, and the truth is to be found in many different religions. And it's also very interesting that both Gorbachev and John Paul II say they have a common vision of the United Europe. You know, talking about these uh, events in the latter days, there was an event, an article in Time magazine, I believe, of October 16, 1989, which, for many people, it was just a, a curio, a curiosity item. But for those with a deeper knowledge of scriptural tradition, I believe it was enough to curdle or chill the blood. Apparently, there is a move underfoot to rebuild the temple at Jerusalem. Now, for many of people, they'll say, oh, that's a very nice thing. But in terms of Catholic prophecy and in terms of what's happening in Europe, it's enough to chill the blood. Father Jenkins, would you like to comment on that? Well, it is rather chilling to hear that. The reason why that is so chilling, as you say, is because of the prophecies with regard to the uh, last era of the world uh, preceding the coming of the Antichrist. Um, the last time the uh, Jewish people tried to rebuild the temple, God vetoed that by raining uh, brimstone down upon them and driving them from the Temple Mount. Uh, that was not too long after the destruction of the temple of Herod the Great uh, in 70 AD. And uh, I understand now that uh, they're even trying to breed the red heifer, which is to be sacrificed in the temple. Uh, they're going through a great deal of effort to prepare the items necessary for the temple worship. Um, this uh, does not bode well uh, in the eyes of Catholic prophecy over the centuries. And uh, con connected with other prophecies with regard to the, to the presence of the Antichrist in the world is actually frightening. There are even some prophecies uh, that say, and these are the fathers of the, fathers of the church from way back, that say that the Antichrist will reign from the temple in Jerusalem. Is this not the Saint rebuilt Pat temple in Jerusalem? And there was even a theologian in the 1930s that said that the the movement uh, to establish Palestine and to rebuild the temple uh, will eventually lead to this. Father Kelly, Pope Pius X said. Uh, during his day that things are so bad in the world that uh, it is possible that the end is very near, that the Antichrist is at hand. And I think if he were to live to see what we experience every day in our life, uh, he would say that it is indeed at hand. And I think that is the explanation of why uh, so many Catholics have fallen away. Uh, it appears to be the great apostasy that virtually the entire hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church has abandoned Christ. Fathers, uh, we have to close now, but in closing, would you say that these events seem to be preparing the way for a very charismatic, popular leader to emerge who might actually uh, fill the description of Antichrist, these events in Europe, the rebuilding of the temple? Definitely. You'll see somebody that will be kind of a combination of John Paul II, Gorbachev, uh, Bush, you know, a very popular person that appeals to everyone. <laughs> Father Kelly. I think so. Uh, I think it's hard to, to avoid the conclusion in, the virt in virtue of what has happened over the last uh, 25 years that uh, the Antichrist in all likelihood is at hand. You've been watching what...